it's alive. Hey everybody, welcome to Building Enter Guys. On this episode, we're gonna focus on the drivetrain. We're gonna install the motor, steering, and the brakes. On the first star car, we designed the steering system from scratch, using chains, gear downs, go-kart parts, it's a whole bunch of work. This time around, we're gonna be using real steering components from the Mazda Miata. We have the steering column, the rack and pinion, the steering wheel, and the rotors. So first, I measured all the components in the Mazda Miata front end, and then designed them in 3D space to make sure the frame would fit around them. Then I installed the front shocks and springs into the frame. It was definitely a challenge. All those components needed to be connected at different angles, so I had to make custom brackets and use metric bolts. And boy, did I have to buy a bunch of metric bolts, because I had to figure which ones would actually fit. Then I placed the steering column and the steering wheel roughly where I wanted it to be, in the middle of the art car. Using an imaginary seat, I kind of figured what height would work, and then I built a frame to support that and bolted it together. So the original Mazda Miata had powered steering. That pump would keep pressure in the rack with the power steering fluid and assist in steering operations. I decided I didn't really want to have that kind of complexity in my steering setup, so I went through a depowering process. So the process for this is pretty straightforward. Open the valves, take all the hoses apart, drain the power steering fluid, and make sure that the insides can actually operate without any pressure. One of my concerns is leaving these valves open, because at Burning Man, all the alkaline sand can actually get inside and actually seize it up. Then I can't steer. That would kind of suck. Now it's time for the rotors. These are the large discs your brakes sit on and squeeze to brake the vehicle. They probably have years of rust from that car just sitting in the scrapyard. So that required a little bit of, uh, a little bit of work. So I took a wire brush accessory and my hand drill and I went at it. This was surprisingly satisfying to do. You see all that rust come off and a shiny finish underneath? I'm pretty happy with the way these came out. I'm just glad I didn't have to replace them. Now installing all these parts was actually pretty straightforward. Each of those rotors is surprisingly heavy. I used both my hands to pick them up. Then they were bolted to the control arms with the suspension springs and shocks running through them. Now it's time for the steering rack. I actually had to create a structure at the front frame to make sure it's bolted on properly. It was a bit tricky because the normal Mazda Miata has a lot longer front end, so the steering column wouldn't have such tight angles. In my case, the U-joint connecting the steering rack to the steering column was almost 90 degrees, and a U-joint stops working around 90 degrees. With the rack now mounted to the front of the frame, all that was left was to thread the ends into the wheel assemblies. When you get a wheel alignment, this is known as adjusting the toe, so basically, how much of the wheels point to in or out. Can you believe this U-joint was the only piece missing from all these steering components? I actually had to buy it new, and it cost me about 10% of all these parts. Also, we wanted the steering wheel in the very middle of the vehicle, and that's very uncommon for cars, so that made the angle even tighter. So this took a bit of time to make sure that everything was mounted perfectly, so the angles would actually be operable. Now we're making some progress. I actually had a hard time finding used tires for the vehicle, so I just went online and I found some cheap Chinese tires. They arrived pretty quick, and I installed them with some fabulous lug nuts that I found on eBay. Putting the first wheel and tire on with our psychedelic lug nuts. Okay, the car is actually sitting on its own weight now. This is a huge goal. Now it's really starting to feel like a car and have a bunch of scrap parts on my garage floor. Now it's finally time to install that motor. One of the main reasons we decided to go with that Mazda Miata was because it's a real drive vehicle. So there's a piece known as a differential in the very back of the vehicle. The original job of the differential was to connect the transmission via a drive shaft to the two real wheels. This makes it a bit easier to convert it to an EV. Without the drive shaft there, all we have to do is connect the electric motor directly into the differential. Originally, the drive shaft would be connected to the differential at a plate with just some bolts. One trick I learned was just to use an old sprocket from the first R car that had a shaft collar on it. And then I drilled holes in the sprocket that aligned directly with the differential mounting plate. This allowed me to bolt them together very securely. Now I can just slide in a steel rod with a metal key and set screw. I decided to reuse the Lovejoy connection from the first R car. That's the piece you see here with the rubber insert. It actually provides us some benefits. The first, it provides us some freedom if there's some movement in the rear end. And second, it converts the shaft size to the one used in the motor. Once again, I'm using parts in the first R car that was built in 2015. This is the golden motor. It's three kilowatt, it's about 10 horsepower. It operates at 48 volts. I designed a motor mount that attaches the motor to the frame in several places. These parts would be under extreme force when driving the vehicle around, so I had to make sure they're really attached well to the frame. With the brushless DC motor, you can't just connect the power cables to the motor and make it go. There needs to be a motor controller between the power supply and the motor. Its job is to read the current state or phase of the motor using a magnetic health sensor. 
Then it would charge different stators, which are the wiring windings inside the motor to cause it to move. This one is a Kelly controller. It's a pretty popular brand for brushless DC motors. It has a digital accelerator pedal and is fully programmable so I can tweak acceleration settings, max speeds, and also read data off of it using a USB to serial connector. To connect the motor controller, I need to run the high voltage battery cables through a fuse and a contactor, which is like a big relay control that would energize the controller when I turn the key on the vehicle on. It's alive. It was so exciting to see the motor spin the tires with power from the batteries we had built by hand. This is a huge milestone here. We quickly realized, just like the first star car, that this motor had to be geared down so it had enough torque to move the current weight of the vehicle. Originally, I thought this differential, which has a 4 to 1 gear ratio built into it, would be enough for this motor. So a 4 to 1 ratio in the differential means it would spin 4 times for every 1 revolution of the wheel, providing more torque. Then I tried using a rubber timing belt as a gear down, because I hate chains, they're so noisy. However, I couldn't get it to grip enough. I wasn't really sure if it wasn't tight enough or just wouldn't work in my use case. Ideally, if this was a real EV conversion, there'd be a custom aluminum piece made that mount the motor to the differential with gears inside. But this option is very, very expensive, several thousands and thousands of dollars. So I needed something cheaper. Since we were running out of time, I decided just to go back to the chain gear down option. I knew that would work, it would just be a little bit too noisy. Now it's time to figure out how to stop this vehicle. And I know nothing about brake systems. Absolutely nothing. It's much funner to see a car drive than it is to get to stop. What I learned was I need a master brake cylinder, so I ordered one of those off eBay. That's this big piece you see here, and you can set air pressure inside. One important thing is this requires air pressure. On the original Mazda Miata, there would be a vacuum tube connection from the gas engine to the master cylinder providing air pressure. But since I don't have that, because I'm an electric vehicle, I need an alternative. I found a used Volvo electric air pump, so I connected that to my low voltage battery pack. This also meant I had to build my own brake lines around the vehicle. which was kind of fun to bend all the brake tubing and crimp all those ends to a splitter back to the master brake cylinder. One important thing about brakes is you need a brake pedal, and I don't have one of those, so I decided just to build one. I used pieces from the old art car, which I think was pretty fitting. I used a 90 degree bracket as the pedal itself and attached it with some springs. It came out really well, kind of artsy. What this does is when you press the brake pedal, you're pushing a push rod into the brake cylinder, which is under pressure and opens a valve. Then the air pressure pushes the brake fluid through the brake lines due to the wheel's brakes, which then clamp down and compress onto the rotors that we cleaned up. Now is the big moment. I poured the brake fluid in and I did the brake bleed process, which takes all the air out of the lines. I pumped the brake pedal several times, and to my surprise, it actually started working. The wheel stopped. I honestly didn't have a lot of faith in this the first time around, and I was really surprised it worked. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, hit the subscribe and notification buttons to be alerted for new episodes each Thursday. And now we have a car that's actually drivable, and just in time, because it's one month until Burning Man. On the next episode of Building Enter Guys, we're going to actually build the seats, install the lights, and the sound system.